I've been interested in cryptocurrency since 2011, and I'm excited to share today on why I'm interested in the space and what's happening at a high level in the industry. So to start off on a personal note, I grew up in the US and my parents are immigrants from China. And I grew up hearing stories of their own childhood talking about their experience during the Cultural Revolution. And my mom's side of the family, this is my mom pictured here with her mom and her grandpa, um, my mom's side of the family was very well educated and fairly well off. But this went against the ideals of the Cultural Revolution. And so what ended up happening is they had their assets seized by the government. And this was a really scary concept for me because it really showed how, uh, how powerful the government was in being able to seize people's assets. And it also showed how quickly government sentiment can actually change. I believe that being well-educated is a good thing, but this was actually not. And even my dad was getting pulled out of university to work on the farmlands. So when I came across Bitcoin, I was really compelled by this idea of censorship-resistant, unseizable money. And it was a really exciting idea for me. I also saw my parents sending money back home from US to China. And as Katie mentioned, it's a very inefficient process, and it can be very expensive. I also ended up working at AIG doing portfolio risk management shortly after the financial crisis. And through this work of risk modeling and stress testing AIG's portfolio, I saw just a lot of the inefficiencies of the financial system and also saw just how centralized points of failures there were. So we all know that the banking system is really inefficient and expensive. So moving our own money requires the trust of these centralized third parties. And so that means that you can't actually move your money when banks are closed. And sending out a wire is very expensive. It can be $30 for a wire. Um, and this makes sending really small payments infeasible. Similarly, if you use the ACH system, it can take four to five business days to actually process your money. So this is not really ideal. And I think a really great example of this is actually the image here. Uh, so in 2008, Morgan Stanley needed an injection of capital to help prevent them from collapsing. So Mitsubishi UFJ agreed to send this money, and they sent $9 billion. But it was a banking holiday in the US and Japan, and so they weren't actually able to wire the money. So what they had to do is write a $9 billion physical check and hand it in person to Morgan Stanley executives. So it even shows how the, the banks can't even move their own money. We're actually very lucky that we even have an inefficient banking system because many people don't even have access to these financial services in the first place. And you can't always rely on government-backed currency. So we saw the $100 trillion note actually issued at one point in Zimbabwe. And there have been stories of people actually burning cash for fuel because the cash is so worthless. You heard before, Venezuela is going through hyperinflation, where the project projected inflation rates are going to be 1 million percent. So all of this has been an issue for a very long time. The banking system is inefficient, people can't rely on their currency, and generally people just can't even have access to basic financial services. So there's been a quest for a very long time for digital money. Bitcoin actually wasn't the first case of digital money. There, there has been demand for this in the past. And the first example of this was actually DigiCash. So DigiCash was created by this world-renowned cryptographer, David Chom, and he proposed this idea of digital money and implemented it in a company in the early 90s. And DigiCash ended up actually going bankrupt and failing as a centralized company. There were other attempts at this. eGold is another example. And eGold was trying to do instant transfer of gold ownership. And they ended up running into legal issues and had to get shut down as well. So there were a lot of attempts at this, but they were all failing because they were centralized entities. So why were they centralized in the first place? Well, they needed to solve this problem called the double spend problem. And the double spend problem is basically making sure that the same digital money doesn't get spent more than once. So if I have $100 in digital money and I spend it with an online merchant, I shouldn't be able to spend that same $100 with another online merchant. And at the time, people needed to have these centralized entities keep track of this internal ledger to make sure that they knew where the money was actually flowing. But there was a really key breakthrough when Bitcoin came along. So Satoshi Nakamoto, uh, the founder of Bitcoin, who no one knows, could be a man or woman, group of people, that's kind of one, one of the lures of Bitcoin and keeps it very decentralized. Uh, Satoshi released Bitcoin to the world in 2009. Uh, the white paper was actually published in, in 2008, and the 10-year anniversary was last week. So it's really exciting to see all the progress that Bitcoin has made over the past 10 years. Uh, Satoshi published this paper, and it talked about network incentives for the first time. And this was a really really key breakthrough, because this now allowed uh, this ledger to now be maintained by a, a network rather than a centralized entity. I and Satoshi himself actually wrote, 
A lot of people automatically dismiss e-currency as a lost cause because of all the companies that failed since the 1990s. I hope it's obvious that it was only the centrally controlled nature of those systems that doomed them. I think this is the first time we're trying a decentralized, non-trust-based system. So within the Bitcoin white paper, Satoshi talks about this idea of a distributed public ledger. And so this is something that doesn't require the centralized third party that we've seen throughout the 90s. And this we refer to as the blockchain, although in the Bitcoin white paper it never says the word blockchain, so I just want to make that very clear. In Bitcoin system, miners are key to the network. So what is a miner? Well, miners are computers that actually maintain the network by validating transactions. Why would any of these computers actually want to spend their computational resources supporting Bitcoin? Well, they actually get incentivized for this service by getting rewarded in Bitcoin. So at a very, very high level, it's a very crude overview of Bitcoin mining, but they're solving these really complex mathematical problems, and the first one to solve this mathematical problem gets the right to write to the Bitcoin public ledger, and they get rewarded in Bitcoin for the service. And so this is known as proof of work which is output that is very difficult to produce, but easy for others to verify. And I like the example of a Sudoku puzzle, because you can easily check that someone did this puzzle correctly, but sometimes it can be a lot of work to actually solve the puzzle. And this is what enables trustless consensus. This is the group of computers that are actually working to support the Bitcoin network. I also want to note that the incentives actually work so well that Bitcoin has become very profitable. So uh, mining Bitcoin is a very competitive industry. So in the early days, you could just link up your computer and start mining Bitcoin. But it's become so competitive that now you need specialized hardware. And this is referred to as ASICs, Application Specific Integrated Circuits. And this is specialized hardware, and in this scenario, created specifically for Bitcoin mining and can't be repurposed to anything else. And in the background here is actually my own ASIC. Um, I had bought this from, uh, from a manufacturer, Bitmain, which is the largest manufacturer of Bitcoin mining equipment. I was really excited. It, it shipped from China, and I was setting it up, and I finally turned it on, and it was so loud. It sounded like a vacuum cleaner going off at all times. And it was so hot, I actually couldn't keep it in my room. So I had to move it to a place that was air conditioned full time. So this isn't completely accessible for everyone nowadays. And we're seeing these industries actually pop up where there's so many mining farms where they're actually consuming as much electricity as some small nation states. So it's a very, very competitive business. And there's a number of people that actually think that this is very um, energy inefficient, so they're trying to build these new consensus mechanisms to try to make things more efficient. So there's a lot of work being done there. So as I talked about, uh, Bitcoin acts as this incentive mechanism for the Bitcoin blockchain to work. And so tokens are a similar concept, and they act as an incentive mechanism oftentimes. So what are tokens? Tokens are digital assets that are stored on the blockchain. So they can act as an incentive mechanism, but they can really also do, represent many other things. They can represent real-world items like gold, to stocks, to bonds, to utility rights, um, the rights to use the platform. Uh, so there are many, many things, and it's a very broad spectrum of what tokens can actually do. And the way that tokens are built are through something called smart contracts. So smart contracts have been around for a while. Uh, it's not a new term, but they really became popularized when Ethereum came along in 2015. So what is a smart contract? Well, a smart contract is a program that's executed by a network of computers. And I find this image on the right really helpful. So on the left, in gray, you have this legal contract. A legal contract is essentially a bunch of if-then statements. If this event happens, then make sure this event happens. Well, you can really convert a lot of this logic into code. And so on the right-hand side, you have this converted if-then statements into a smart contract, into code. And so now you have incentives uh, you can incentivize through a coin or token to incentivize these computers to now execute the, the code in these smart contracts. So in Bitcoin's case, the tokens are actually validating transactions. And in this case, the computers are now executing code. And so this is what enables trustless consensus and doesn't require a middleman. But it also extends way beyond just legal contracts. So smart contracts are the building blocks for many other applications. And we refer to these as decentralized applications, or dApps. And so these are applications that run on a decentralized network. They're censorship resistant and can't be shut down. But the thing that excites me the most is that smart contracts actually enable applications that have not been possible before. A great example of this is the decentralized prediction market platform, Augur. So what is a prediction market? Well, a prediction market allows participants to bet on the likelihood of an event occurring. And so here's a screenshot of Augur here. We just had the election, and you can see here people are betting on political events and, and whether or not um, there's a certain candidate winning. 
And we've seen prediction markets in the past. This is not a new concept. We've seen something like in-trade before. But they've actually been shut down. Uh, they've run into regulatory issues. The operators might have been corrupt. So there's been a lot of issues um, with centralized prediction markets in the past. So platforms like Augur and Gnosis and a few others really wanted to create this decentralized prediction market, something that could never be shut down and was completely censorship resistant, and anyone can create markets. And so the unique, the unique problem here is that Something like Augur requires something called an oracle, which is a trusted source of information. Basically, if you're creating a prediction market, you need to know what the outcome of that actual prediction market was. You need to know who won the, who won the market. And so in Augur's case, they didn't want to have centralized oracles. They didn't want to have something like Thomson Reuters pulling in information, because that goes back to the situation where you now have to trust a centralized entity. So they're creating something called a decentralized oracle. So the way that Augur does it, I think, is really innovative. So Augur itself did a token sale, and they issued a bunch of tokens to the public, and these tokens are called REP. So now, these token holders are randomly selected to report on the outcome of these prediction markets. And if they're caught reporting incorrectly, they're actually punished for this behavior. So this is a really innovative incentive mechanism to get your decentralized oracle. And this decentralized oracle is really fascinating, because you can imagine taking this decentralized source of information and plugging it into other decentralized applications that need this feed of information from an external party. And so, Prediction markets can go also beyond just sports betting and political events. You can actually use it for a lot of different purposes, like insurance, and you can, you can hedge yourself in financial markets. But one interesting concept that you can use this for is called futarchy. So futarchy was proposed by Robin Hansen, uh, and, and this is the idea that uh, policy decision makers can use the outcome of prediction markets to help them inform policy decisions. So you can imagine creating a market where you're saying, well, implementing this policy increased the GDP by X percent, and people can now vote on the outcome of this prediction market. And the idea is that people generally put their money where their mouth is. So this is a, this is a very uh, innovative concept, and I think is worth experimenting with at some point. And another, another thing that crypto enables is that people can now own their own identity and reputation data. And this is highly relevant as people's data is now being shared with third parties where they don't want it to be shared or they don't know it's being shared. And I think a, an interesting application here is that right now in the US we have these credit scoring agencies that, that basically have your credit score that determines your credit worthiness and whenever you're trying to get a loan or trying to rent a house or something. And a lot of people just don't have a strong credit score. They might be new to this country or they might be very young and haven't built up a credit score or they just aren't even familiar with how to build up a credit score. So the, a lot of people don't even know like, you know, checking your own credit score can hurt your own credit score. So, in this system, you could imagine people being able to build up a reputation through these decentralized applications and having full control over this data and share this selectively with people who are considering giving them a loan. So there's a lot of really amazing decentralized financial applications that are coming about in this industry. Another unique concept is decentralized autonomous organizations or companies. This is also called DAOs or DACs. And these are organizations that run through the rules encoded in smart contracts. And you can essentially have networks replace entire corporations. I know this sounds really crazy, but we're, and we're very much in the early days of this, but we're already seeing examples where token holders are, are voting on how the organization's funds should be used. So we're, we're really experimenting with this and seeing how it plays out. And I think there's a lot of lessons to be learned here. And what I'm most excited about, though, is you can experiment with new governance and economic systems at a much faster rate than you've ever been able to experiment with before. And so you can really take the most beneficial systems for society and start implementing those. So I initially joined the crypto space because I was really excited about this idea of an unseizable, censorship-resistant money. But through working in this industry in places like Coinbase, I, I realized that there's so much technological innovation that's actually happening here, and it's really about more than just currency. So I hope that you found some of the points in my talk interesting and it's compelled you to dive deeper into this space. Thank you.